All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from a sunny San Diego. And today, I'm delighted to be joined just up the road, right, in Orange County? Yes, uh, yes I am. And it's a beautiful sunny day here, too. <laughs> yeah, well, I hope so. <laughs> By Neil Sahota. And Neil is United Nations AI advisor, IBM master inventor, author of the best-selling book, Own the AI Re um, Revolution, and part-time professor at UC Irvine. You've worked with enterprises and multiple industries, and uh, you also help organizations create culture, infrastructure, and ecosystems needed to achieve success, um, such as the UN's AI for Good initiative. And, and that's what I wanted to talk to you today about and welcome you back, Neil. Uh, the last time we talked, we talked about AI, but that seems like it was about 400 years ago, given the <laughs> amount of uh, uh, you know development since. So um, just from your point of view, what do you think is uh, just baseline for us? What are some of the evolutions that we've seen in, in maybe even in the last like six to 12 months or the direction that we're starting to go? Because it feels like things are moving at, at such a rapid pace. I mean, they, they are, John. I mean, we say we're living in an age of hyper change that we're going to experience 100 years worth of change in the next 10 years. So even the last you know, 6 to 12 months, there's been a lot of change. Uh, the two big ones, the first one is large language models, LLMs. We've mm -hmm. seen an explosion of Gen AI. So it's not just chat GPT on the block anymore. You got BARD, you got Claude and perplexity, and we're, we're seeing all these things really being woven more into almost like personal assistance as people are even using them to like plan vacations and write resumes and look for jobs, mm -hmm. which really ties to this, the second big change that's really emerged like in the last three, four months is the rise of AI agents. So not like spy agents or something yeah. like that, <laughs> but uh, we really have these little AI, you know, for better, lack of a better word, bots that they're 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 already trained to do certain things, and they're just looking for triggers or environmental changes or something to activate and perform their functions. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about like you know even selling something now, it's not that you get prompted and said you want to talk to a chatbot or something. You might actually be interacting with one of these AI agents, and right. you know, it's actually having the conversation with you. So. Mm -hmm. We actually believe that probably by the end of the decade, uh, sales and marketing will actually happen where their AI agent is actually talking to your AI assistant. So sales is going to happen AI to AI and we're trying to take the human out of the equation. <laughs> well, that's a, uh, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a fascinating thought. Uh, you know, both the, the AI assistant talking to the AI sales. What about the, uh, uh, particularly because your work with the UN and that, uh, what, what are the conversations happening around, uh, around ethics and all of that because i mean for situations now because we're getting good voice cloning all of this kind of stuff like um but do you think that people should know always you know if they're interacting with ai if they're interacting with the bot if it's not a real person is that, do, do you think people have the right to know that or do you think if the experience works it doesn't really matter I, I think that they should have the right to know or at least ask the question i'm not so sure a lot of people care mm -hmm. uh, you know uh you know except for some uh, you know particular circumstances like last year there were some bad actors that actually mined social media and they created deep fake audio of people's children mm -hmm. so they would wait till the, the child was in school call one of the parents say we've kidnapped your kid right and like i want to talk to my kid and so they would play the ai deep deep fake audio and it could interact and sound like their kid and say things like their kid would and so it freaked people out. I mean, you know, it's not like bad actors are unfortunately going to disclose that, hey, this is a, oh, yeah. you asked the question, it's a fake. But we're, we're unfortunately seeing more of these things in elections. Mm -hmm. um, this whole thing around what we call misinformation is becoming very prevalent. That's the weaponization of information. And mm -hmm. I think we, we should have the right to know, at least ask the question. But I also know, and I can't name names, a lot of celebrities actually use digital twins, you know, the mirror mm -hmm. image of a deep fake, 
to do more commercials, to shoot more, you know, TV shows or movies or to do fan engagement. And they don't really want their fans to know that. So oh, yeah, yeah, I yeah, can see it's, that. It's a, it's a catch 22. That's, mm -hmm. that's the problem. Yeah, and then um, on on the on the uh, on the bigger issue then about uh, you know who own you know who owns or who should have visibility and transparency into AI. I mean, there's this. I mean, originally even you know people were saying, oh, it should all be open source, which I think it probably should be. But but right now, what is that debate like around like how how is this going to be? managed going forward so that we don't fall into all these uh, traps it's a it's a great question and we don't have a great answer yet we need to establish some sort of universal or global set of of policies and regulations and that also means that we have to define what right uses because we all have different moral codes what we're talking about in the united nations right now is should we create a new agency just around the governance of science and technology to try and actually set those standards. You know, can we at least corral some of the stuff so that most people are on the same page? Because unfortunately, bad actors will still do bad things. But that's that's it's not a it's not a quick task, and you know, it's it's a burning problem right now. And the honest truth is, is you know that Spider-Man meme where everyone's pointing at each other, John. Yeah, that's kind of the world we live in right now, where. You know, engineers and technologists, they build to an outcome, right? I, I want to be able to do X. And so they yeah. build something that does X. They're not thinking about other uses or misuses, right? And so the regulators are, you know, they're saying like, shouldn't the regulators be worried about that? And the regulators yeah. are like, we, we don't understand this stuff well <laughs> enough to know what else could be done with it. So they look at the companies, right? Yeah. The companies are like, well, we don't know. We're looking at you technologists, right? <laughs> they're looking at the regular. So we're just pointing at each other. What we really need is a different kind of mindset, a different approach to regulations where mm -hmm. all these parties are at the table. But we have to also get good at proactive thinking. Yeah. Thinking yeah. about these other uses or misuses. And that's that's tough for us because we've just been used to doing reactionary things for so long. Mm -hmm. And with them, um, with with the you know with the uh, you know the advent of of you know natural language querying and that uh, and and people starting to get used to doing that. Uh, I mean, do you see a time when we will? That's how we'll primarily interact with different tools. I mean, even with our voice, forget about even typing it in, but like saying you know natural language queries and natural language commands to to the to to products and they will give us what we're looking for is is that where you think it's going to go actually to a degree we're already there john mm -hmm. uh sephora has actually built an ai engine so that when you search for something it actually their ai will actually take the keywords from your search results and create an instantaneous landing page create a link based on your keywords create a landing page highlighting the things you're looking for in their product line so to some degree we're already there the next real evolution is just is this actually even beyond language where you have a lot of people now tapping into kinesiology so that if there is like a video feed or a photo or even audio the tone of your voice they're going to try and infer a lot of behavioral clues about your state and things like that to actually create a deeper level of connection and information so you could see a, a situation in the future where you could do that based on, you know, the phone calls and emails and, you know, whatever that you could actually figure out, okay, I, I can figure out where Neil is in this whole process right now, what these cues are, et cetera. Yeah, we, we can. We, uh, you know, part of this like kind of psychographic and neuro linguistic analysis, we actually did a, a pilot with a, an auto dealership. And so just through the chat, we could actually figure out, is this person looking to buy a car today, this week, in a month, or you know, more than a month out? Mm -hmm. And the analysis of like 300 different chats and people, it went 300 for 300. Wow. Wow. Um, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, I, I think that's where it's going to be incredibly. Uh, you know, it's going to bring incredible efficiency. But I also think it's a great way of 
let's face it there's a lot of there's a lot of products that have uh, you know great power in them and let's say even like with with pipeline or crm there's a lot of things you can do but uh, you know the more advanced you get the, the obviously the learning curve goes up a wee bit uh, you know with any with any product or service um what I see is this then being able to unlock that power because it will remove kind of a lot of the learning curve if you can interact, you know, with natural language. Well, hundred percent, you know, you, you just think about the sales process and, you know, there's different kinds of features and we kind of, you know, I hate to say it this way, you know, sell to a set and say like, I got these four talking points. So I'm going to use all four talking points. But what we're really learning is with AI, it's like we can figure out and say, this person only cares about this one talking point. So just focus on that one, mm -hmm. right? Get through the noise. So what we're really evolving to is that we can create kind of an AI sales assistant that can understand a customer, whether that's B2C or B2B, like their best friend understands that person and then communicate the same way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, it's really fascinating. And then the, I mean, you were talking about obviously there's a lot of Gen AI, AI, AI tools and that, and and you know companies are looking at okay, what can we do internally and uh, and how can we use them internally and the whole security issue around the, their data. I mean, just talk to me a little bit about that because I think um, I feel that sometimes there's a little bit of a misunderstanding. I mean, in order to do this, you need your internal data. It's going to have to be pretty clean. Right, you're going to have to pretty clean, and you're going to need to have enough of it in order for it to be, you know, effective. So, what do you what do you see around that? Because I, I think people are starting now to look a lot more at, you know, how do I bring this into my organization, and how do I use that with a kind of a controlled data set? Yeah, so a couple of things to unpack there. So, the first, the general rule of thumb, John, is if you're paying for it, you retain your own data and you have your own models. The, the truth is, is, it's not like there's one Uber system. It's like there's one Uber chat GPT that knows everything. When you're paying for it, you get your own private instance. So it's separated from everything else. Mm -hmm. No one can see what you're doing and you can't see what other people are doing. So, and you can, it's written in the terms of conditions. So if you're using internal data, you know, internal models, you'll, they'll still be protected. And let's be honest, if, if you're really worried that, you know, Sam Altman's gonna steal that, they make a lot of money selling the subscriptions. You know, mm -hmm. they're not going to give all that up. Yeah. Right. That goes to the second challenge that is, do you actually have the data? Do you have enough data? And then is it structured well enough? So is it, have you cleaned it, so to speak, so that AI can consume it? So there's a lot of obviously data, data service companies that help with that. But one of the big challenges organizations tend to run into is they often don't have enough data. And what we're now actually going into this kind of new frontier is what we call synthetic data. Mm. So synthetic data is actually fake data it's, that looks like real data. So we can actually manufacture. And one of the first areas we started using this was actually in banks. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of mandates by government agencies around the world now to actually use AI to help look for fraud and money laundering detection. And you hope the banks don't have enough data to change an AI system that right. so we actually had to manufacture data that could appear like this is money laundering or it, it kind of looks like money laundering, but it's actually legitimate. So we had to come up with all these different scenarios, stuff like that. So we could actually create enough data for that. That's expanded out into other areas like healthcare. Mm. So even like medical imaging now, we actually create synthetic data so we can teach an AI how to read like a sonogram. Wow. wow, that's that that that's real. That, that's absolutely fascinating because yeah, I can see I can see where that would uh, I can see where they would have to do that with you know banks and stuff like that. That, that that's that's uh, that's really interesting. And then, what do you see? Uh, um, do you see this becoming easier and easier to um, leverage? You know, for companies to leverage this, and uh, and and where do you think some of the other applications are going to go for for AI? So interesting question. This it's a two-edged sword right now. I think it's actually becoming easier, more accessible, just from a, a use simplicity standpoint as well as a cost. The second edge there, though, is there's just a insane amount of tools being released. Some mm -hmm. of them, unfortunately, are hype and fluff. Some of them don't really have any value. Some are fantastic, but now as a 
organization, you have to kind of wade through all this stuff to find the real ones. And I think that's that's become a major challenge. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, I mean, obviously part of that too is, I, I mean, I think there's still a kind of misunderstanding about a, what AI really is and what it isn't. And also, you know, it's been used as kind of a catch-all term, let's face it. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's been rolled under AI that's not really AI. So how do how does somebody be, what's the best way of somebody being able to be discerning about the, the tools that they use? You got to do some due diligence. I hate to say it that way. And if you don't know how to do that, there are reputable people to help you do that. But you have to understand what is it they're actually doing. And it's not about understanding the technology and don't get sucked in by like LLM and Gen AI, those things. At the end of the day, what you want to ask is, what inputs are you taking from me and what outputs am I actually going to get? You know, I there's a small boutique law firm, you know, friend of a friend reached out to, can you help these guys out? So I was talking with them and you know, they, they wanted to build a, a little AI system to help, you know, generate contracts, you know, so you can mm -hmm. do more business. They have 30 years experience, tons of data. And, you know, they had two proposals on tools, you know, vendors that they said, and I was listening to them like, that sounds like what they're charging you is really cheap. I, I, I can't believe they're actually doing this for you, right? These tools are actually work this way. So they asked me if I could check it out. So I, I did. And I'm like, oh, they're not actually doing what you're asking for, mm -hmm. right? What they're really doing is creating a giant search engine for you. And then just based on some things, they'll try and pull a, a past contract out and give it to them, which you don't mm -hmm. want to do. Yeah. Right. And that means that then whoever's using this tool, you know, your, your client actually has, has to understand the terms, the conditions, all these things to do that in the first place. And that's not at all what they wanted. And they're like, whoa, is that what this actually does? <laughs> so I'm like, I show them like, look, this is what they're asking for input. And this is what they're showing gets produced. So you really have to look at those inputs and outputs and see, is, are you really getting what you asked for or what you need? Yeah, that, that, and that's a really interesting example there because I feel like that's going to happen to a lot of people where, uh, you know, they're going to be given things like a, an advanced search engine when they think they're getting uh, they're getting some AI. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges is making sure, and, and I think that's going to give, obviously, consultants and third-party people a, a good business because, you know, you're going to need, as you said, to find somebody trustworthy in order to evaluate are you getting exactly what you uh, what you are looking for. Um, and what did you see on a, on a, on a broader level? Um, uh, give me your future. I mean, as you said, everything is so rapidly increasing. What do you think are some of the things that are going to surprise us down the road? Uh, <laughs> Probably a few things. I mean, by the end of the decade, I really think that uh, brands will have like, you know, little AI bots that now try and sell to your AI system. I think AI is going to be trying to convince your AI to buy something. We're going to start removing humans from the equation. <laughs> um, I also think we're going to see a rise in artificial empathy. Mm. So this whole area about creating more uh, engaging talk, you know, connecting, joking, picking up on the emotional sentiment of a person and dynamically changing how you interact based on that. So it has a more natural feel. And that's probably going to fuel the rise of digital twins. So odds are, and honestly, John, in probably three or four years, it'll be 50-50 if you're talking to a real person or their avatar. <sighs> I know, and isn't it isn't it kind of um, I've seen a few examples. There's one guy, um, CEO of a company. I can they they do uh, video av avatars or whatever. We reproduce yourself, and he has these. You know, he comes on and explains them in the video, but it's not him, but it looks like him, and it sounds like him. So I can see where you know that this is where this is where that's headed, and you're saying it's already today. Digital twins is is already uh, quite prevalent. I mean, it is, and one of the popular tools is called HeyGen, and, you know, you, you sit in front of it for two minutes, it captures your body language, your voice and stuff, and then you can actually use it to generate, you know, videos, and, you know, you can give it a script, you can give it PowerPoint, it'll do all these things on the fly, and it can do it in multiple languages. Nice. So if we fed this video into HeyGen, 
you, John, you and I could be doing this in like Japanese or French or something like that. Yeah, no, absolutely. And for those watching and listening, yeah, we we'd experimented. One of the guys who works with me a few uh, about a couple of months ago, he sent me a video of myself delivering uh, delivering a talk in perfect German. Um, in my accent, sounded exactly like me, uh, but it was absolutely perfect German because I sent it on to the CEO, the founder of this company, who's Austrian, so he speaks German. And he was like, "Yeah, it's fluent." <laughs> <laughs> scary stuff well listen thanks again neil all of neil's information will be below this video but before we go please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do well, i i'm a you know the united nations ai advisor we're always looking for more volunteers but you know I, i'm a big believer that this technology can be, <clears throat> be the driver not the passenger so i really help organizations figure out what they should be doing with the technology what problems they can solve and, you know, I try and be a resource of information because I want to help everyone on this journey. So, uh, you know, feel free to always reach out to me if you need help. And, uh, you know, don't be afraid to take a little bit of a risk. You know, yeah. it's just a tool, John. It's all about how we choose to use it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, that's and thanks again, Neil. Thank you for watching and listening. I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.